Atlassian, passion for software. So when I developed this talk, I was so passionate that I did 150 slides. So this is a downgraded version, actually. So I'm, I was very passionate uh, with Atlassian's passion for software that I did so many slides and it took so long. So, But let's start with me. Uh, I'm Sven Peters. I'm the Atlassian ambassador. Um, tweet me at SvenPet, at SvenPet.com. That's my, my web blog. You can watch some passion, read, read about passion on, on that too. Um, and I'm actually responsible for the DACH region, so Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. So let, let me tell you a little bit about me. So when I was young, I was, was a very, very good sportsman. So we did something in Germany called the Bundesjugendspiel. And at, at this event, there were three things we had to do. We had to run, we had to jump, and we had to throw. And I was, was actually good at running and jumping. I was really good at jump, running and jumping when I was small. And I, I sucked with uh, throwing. Um, I actually did negative throws in the negative direction and I hit my, my teacher. But anyway, um, I was so good that I get, got this one. And this is called Aaron Okunde. And you get this for, for awesome, awesome sports things you, you, you did at the Bundesjugendspiel. And uh, this was in 1981, so I got good potential actually to being a really good sportsman. And I was I was doing some some athletics afterwards, and I was I was I was pretty good at that. Um, but then with 13, 14 years, I don't know. I I had some other interests, so I was not not really passionate about sports. Uh, not not like this guy Usain Bolt. He won six gold medals during Olympics and actually this is with all Olympionics we saw uh, in, in London this summer. They are so passionate and actually they are really passionate and they have to be passionate to, to, to be that good. Um, so, <clears throat> but to reach that, that goal, to be at the Olympics and to be a really good sportsman, you, you need to get up every morning and do sports and if it's if it's raining if it's snowing you have to go to the gym all day 365 days a year um, so at the olympics passion is the norm but what has that to do with atlassian at atlassian passion is the norm so if you if you met people at atlassian summit our our conference uh, or atlassian unite in europe if you meet atlassian people you and spoke with them. You could you could really feel that passion. So this is Ken Olofsson, our Jira marketing manager. And if you talk with him about Jira, you can expect that he's passionate about Jira. I mean, he's a product marketing manager of the Jira family. Um, but also, if you if you talk to developers, if you talk to a Confluence developer about Jira, he's also this this developer is also passionate about 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 Jira, even though he's a Confluence developer. So, <clears throat> and if you talk with him about software development, of course he's passionate. I mean, yeah, he's, he's a developer. Um, so at Atlassian, no matter to who you speak, to secretary, to marketing, we are passionate about our customers and actually what we do. So we are we are really passionate. But is that all? Is passion really uh, driving your business to, to success? Well, let's have a look at Sun Microsystems. Well, Sun was a great, great company in the 90s and the early 2000s. But actually, the late 2000s were... Um, oh, let me tell you this story. They developed JavaFX, a very passionate. But actually, they didn't see really HTML5 coming. So JavaFX was a competitive flash, and HTML5 uh, was coming up on the horizon. But they still kept developing JavaFX and actually... I didn't see a market for that, and most people didn't see a really a market for that. Or another story, Sun, they, they, they developed uh, the Java App Store, so an application store for Java applications. Why should a customer care about what programming language your application is written in? I mean, really, uh, they don't care if it's C++, Ruby, or whatever. So they were passionate, but they didn't control their passion very good, Sun Microsystems, that so they got bought by Oracle, the business side. And actually, Oracle 
putting everything in, in, in time boxes. So we got, we got a release every one or two years of Java, and that was good because Sun didn't, didn't give us Java for, for, for ages, so a new version of Java for ages. So they, that, that they, Oracle did that. They said, we're going to release Java, but with less features Sun promised, we're going to release the next version of Java. Cool. Um, but actually, I was missing a little bit of the passion. I mean, they will get rid of the Java App Store and said Java FX is not only for the it's not not anymore available for the browser, but for the desktop. Um, that was good decisions, but I was missing the passions, and I think a lot of developers were miss missing the passion at Sun because they have very passionate developers, but most of them left left Sun Microsystems. So, what, what has that to do with Atlassian? I think Atlassian has a pretty good balance between passion, the passion side, and the business side. So, and we, start with, we started with passion. Ten years ago, actually, Atlassian started uh, Mike Cannon Brooks, who's shaking his head right now, and Scott Farquhar, who's shaking his head right now, were starting Atlassian in 2002. And yeah, it, it takes two. And oh, if, you, if you take a look around at, at successful companies, most of them started with two founders. And if you look at Microsoft, HP, Apple, all of them have, have two founders. But with Atlassian, it's a little bit special because these two founders are, are the same, actually. They are both developers and they have done every job in the company. So they know the company inside out. And well, may, maybe they are, they are the same, but they are also a little bit different. I mean. Scott is more looking at numbers and uh, more working with his head, and, and Mike is more the stomach-driven uh, person who has some feelings and has good ideas. Um, Scott has also good ideas, by the way. <laughs> okay, so so it takes two, and they they started actually uh, the both of them with a vision. They wanted to they wanted to, if if you, if you take a look at the enterprise in the early two thousands, well, it was. Enterprise software for software development was very expensive. I mean, I, I, I bought a Jabil uh, uh, license for 2,000 euros, an IDE license, to, to build my code. Now you get it for free or for, for 500 euros. Um, so they had the vision that um, they, they wanted to make software development tools available also for small teams that have, don't have a big budget like enterprise uh, enterprises. So that was the vision they started with. And they were very successful with, with, with that business model. And they wanted to make a great place to work. And if you look, what, what does it mean, a great place to work? Well, it actually means you want to, want to have great people. Um, great people attract great people too. So you want great people that you can look up to and uh, that, that, that drives your business. And they wanted to, to make a, a place where work and fun goes together. So where you work together and play PlayStation in, in, the, in the lunch breaks or have some jokes, make some jokes together uh, during your work and you can laugh together or go to the pub afterwards, after, after your work. So this, 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 they want to have work and fun together and then they want to give developers the freedom to, to create their own ideas into, into the products and uh, to, to choose their, their own uh, me methodology they like to develop, how, how they like to develop. So, and they wanted that people are, respect each other. So you can have hard discussions at Atlassian, but we respect each other. So um, we can drink a beer afterwards with each other. So it's, it's really, we wanted to have these people that, uh, that also were looking for, for that great place to work. And it's, it's really hard to pick that right people. And it took a long time for Atlassian to grow because we wanted to be sure that we picked the right people. So the, the people with the Atlassian gene inside. Um, and if you, if you go come to, to San Francisco, visit our office uh, in San Francisco, it's, it's a great place to work. Okay, let's have a look at that. Passion for getting things done. We're passionate about getting things done. Um, we wanted to, to create a place where you can get information fast. You, you, you probably have seen the matrix where Trinity 
needs to fly a helicopter and she says, all right, I need to fly a helicopter. And uh, the, the manual of the helicopter is loaded directly into her head. And we wanted to create a place where people find information very, very fast. And uh, maybe, maybe it's a coincidence, but uh, actually that place is uh, shown in the metrics where we invented this, where we invented Confluence, our uh, software for getting information fast. So, and actually the Atlassian office is in the matrix. So Atlassian, everything is in the wiki. Well, I, I don't have a network drive somewhere where I can put on my, my files. I put everything in the wiki. And if you, if you look at the wiki at Atlassian, well, there's a lot of information. If you, if you, if you, if you log into our extranet, wow, you get, you get really this water get, gets, gets really in your face. And so much information, you need to apply some filters. You need to learn that. But our wiki is used for, for many, many, many things. So let's have a look at that. So we use our wiki for developing ideas fast. Actually, if a developer or somebody at Atlassian has an idea, he writes a blog post. And after 24 hours, his personal idea uh, grow and grow into 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 a company idea because everybody is 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 giving him feedback about his idea and and giving his own giving their own perspective to his idea. So after twenty four hours, we have a company idea. Actually, um, that's that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and we we uh, give company updates. Our founders Scott and Mike give updates about about the the company. So we have some founder updates uh, frequently. And the cool thing is, I mean, I've I've done I've seen that also in some intranets where uh, the CEO is giving updates about the company. But the cool thing is that Atlassian, we put it in a wiki. So and that means people can comment on that. People can say, hey, Mike, I didn't understand this thing. Can you explain that a little bit more? And uh, Mike, Mike is just doing it. So um, there's, there's, you can start a whole conversation on, on, on company goals and company strategy. And this is really, really working at Atlassian. And actually want to share knowledge. Um, so it happened to me that I've been to, to a conference. And on that conf after the conference, I wanted to type, I wrote a mail to my boss saying, okay, I have some learnings from these companies. These things went good and these things didn't went so good. And my boss wrote me back on the email and said, hey, why don't you share it with the whole company? Why, why don't you share your experience? I mean, everybody should learn from it in Atlassian. So, and this is, this is really the culture at Atlassian. We want to share, share our knowledge. We don't hide and, and sit on all our knowledge. Um, we want to share everything. And we do project planning in, in our wiki. And this is pretty cool. I mean, if I start, before, before I worked for Atlassian, when I started a new project, I invited, I don't know, 15 people. And maybe, maybe also, uh, if it's just a small design thing, I also invited a designer to a meeting. Uh, but, but he really didn't, didn't need to be there. I mean, it just was five minutes that, that, that he needed to be there. Now, nowadays, I just mention him in our wiki. And he gets an email and said, you should have just mentioned on that new project, you, are, you need to have to design a sticker or whatever. So, and we have open discussions at Alessia. This is really, really important. We can discuss about things. We can say, okay, we, we don't like that or we like that. And we have very, very open, open discussion but with respect for each other. So actually, it's not just a wiki at a lesson. It's, it's a whole culture um, that, that we have. It's a, it's a wiki culture, uh, our discussion things and sharing knowledge and things like that. Um, it's, but it's actually not, not, not just a culture. It's, it's, it's not, not just a tool we're using. It's the people that drives the tool. It's... it's it's more than a tool. It's, it's the people at Atlassian that drives it. So, but I talk to a lot of companies and they fail to get started, to get new people on board with this wiki culture. So here's what we do at Atlassian. Well, when you start at Atlassian, you get a task list. Of course, this task list is in the wiki and Confluence. 
And your first task is it to copy this task list into your own space. So you learn some things about how to use the wiki. And if, if you have the task list in your space, the first thing on this task list is to write a personal blog post. Introduce yourself to the company, to your new teammates, to, the, to, the, to, to all employees at Atlassian. And this is, this is really, really cool because people are first a little bit afraid of writing a blog post. But if you have posted this, you get so much feedback from the company saying, welcome, great. Oh, you like football. We're going to the football game at the weekend. Come and join us. So that's, that's really cool and that really gets you into, into the conversation culture of Atlassian. We have a passion to fail. Oh, well, that's a little bit, maybe a little bit too much. Um, but but let, let me explain how I mean this passion to fail. At Atlassian, failure is not an option. So if, if we fail, that's not an option. It's actually a step. So we, we respect failure. I mean, we, we're calculating that we will also fail. We are expecting that, that we can fail. Uh, but the important thing is, uh, how, what, what do we learn from our failures? So how do we do that in, in software? How do we learn from failures in software? Well, it's actually getting feedback. We want to have feedback for our software. We want to have feedback. When we suck, we want to know it. So we want to actually have our feedback cycle short. And let me explain to you why. Um, and recently, I was, I was I'm traveling a lot. Um, and I'm in, at hotels and I have this shower and if I turn on the, the hot water in the shower at some showers it takes maybe 10 seconds until the hot water comes and then I oh it's too hot then I turn a little bit uh, lower and uh, on one more cold water and then it's too cold and then it's too hot and, so, and sometimes it takes three minutes to adjust the right temperature but if the if the shower is good it takes me just five seconds to adjust the right temperature and I can, can go showering. So we want to have feedback cycles as short as possible and of course as direct, directly to the, to the uh, developers. I mean if a salesperson is traveling around half a year and giving a list of, of features to the developer, well that doesn't work really. Uh, you want to have direct, direct feedback, direct conversations from customer to developer. So how do we collect feedback at Atlassian? Well, we get feedback uh, through our public issue tracker, jira.atlassian.com. You can give us feedback directly and developers are reading that. And then we have a public support forum, answers.atlassian.com. Also here, the answers, uh, the questions are being reading by, by developers and they answer, answer this. So that's where you, where, you get, get, where you can provide feedback for our software directly and a lot of people are are using this system. And then of course we're doing customer interviews. We, are, we uh, ask customers what they think about our software and how they use it and actually we're doing paper prototypes with our customers. So we're trying new user experience things on paper and trying them out with our customers, showing them to our customers and, and get their opinion what they think, um, how, how that looked like and how that uh, user experience, or how the interaction is. And we get feedback through dogfooding. So dogfooding is actually alpha testing our software internally. So we deploy our software internally on our servers and use them for writing our software. That's pretty awesome. I mean, we're in a pretty awesome situation that we are doing software for software developers and we're developing software, so uh, we're have to use our software. Um, so this is, this is pretty awesome. But also our, our marketing department is using Confluence heavily um, and, and they are providing feedback uh, w with every new Confluence uh, deployment on our test servers. And we get feedback through On Demand, our cloud service. So when we, when we started our cloud servers, we, we measure what customers are doing. So we can, we can say this feature is not used very heavily and this feature is used very heavily. So we, we, should, we should really develop this feature more and less this feature. Um, this, is, this is pretty awesome. 
And actually, that we, we found out that uh, on Jira, on our issue tracker, uh, if you edit an issue, in 80% of all cases, you edit one field. And that's why we introduced inline edits in Jira 5.1. So we're getting feedback through on demand. But also, we want to have feedback about our own processes, about our own development, how we are doing. Are we sucking? Or are we, are we pretty, pretty awesome developers and uh, marketeers? So we, we, in order to do that, you need to measure. And we are wild about measuring. We, are measuring, we measure the time we spend on a an, on an feature. Uh, we measure how many features we completed in an iteration, how many code reviews we do, how many lines of code we review, how many lines of code we don't review, and of course our test server performance. We want to, go, we want to know if our test server performance goes down and, have to, and, and then we can do something about it. Um, but also our marketing is measuring of course the sales, um, how many evaluations got downloaded and be installed? Uh, what was the web traffic on our web page? Uh, how many ads of, on how many ads were customers have clicked? Uh, things like that. So and and of course we don't stop there. Also, our support is measuring heavily how many support cases they received. Uh, how how was the customer satisfaction? And uh, what, what was the response time? But we don't stop there. Also, our talent department, our HR department, is measuring how many applicants we had and how many phone interviews we, we, we did and all this stuff. And all this stuff goes into our in one database. And that's what we call our green zone database. And then uh, we can do automatic reports directly out of this database. So everybody that can write an SQL statement, and at Atlassian, I, I think it's 80% of all people um, that can do that. Uh, can can make reports in in our our wiki in our extranet, and these are these reports are live data. So I can compare the sales from this week to last week, and see how how the sales are performing, and react very quickly on that. So, um, but this has one disadvantage. We want to know also. I mean, not not everybody is is just going inside our wiki. And look at the data. The data should show up in your face, should really jump into your face. And that's why we have information radiators at Atlassian at a lot of places. Information radiators are televisions that are showing actual data of the of current iteration, for example, for developers. So this is this is a scrum board on our information radiator. So everybody that can, walks by. Uh, can see how the iteration is going. They don't have to disrupt the team, say, hey, how is it going? So you can just look at the at the information radiator and see what the team is working on. The team can see the build status. So if the build fails, they can react directly. Um, this is an information radiator of our extranet, the activity on our extranet. So they can react also pretty pretty fast if something's Something's fishy here, and this is and this is an information radiator in our Atlassian Amsterdam office and our support. So you can see in red uh, all support cases that are escalating at the moment, and uh, down underneath that we have a Twitter wall. We are also answering support cases via Twitter. All right. So the next passion I want I want to talk to you about is passionate developers. At our lesson, we have a lot of passionate developers. It's a little bit like Steve Ballmer said. Developers, 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 developers. Yes. Yes, developers are pretty important at Atlassian, and uh, they're actually driving our business. I mean, they are doing the software that we are selling, so they are very, very important, and we have passionate developers. I thought this was would be a good, good title, uh, passionate developers. But then I, I watched some some television at night, and I saw this guy, Doctor House, and he's a genius, a medical genius. Uh, but actually, if he would be a genius developer, he wouldn't work for Atlassian. Why? Because he's not nice to people. 
I mean, he cannot work together with people. He's he's maybe genius, but no, he cannot work work together with people. Uh, that's why I changed the title of, of, of this chapter here and say it's not passionate developers, it's actually passionate teams. And it's, I, I, I would say it's a little, a little bit like Steve Barmer saying, teams, 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 teams. In Atlassian we have uh, something, uh, we, have, we have small teams. So in Atlassian a team is eight to nine developers or eight to nine people. Um, and the advantage if you have small teams is that for an iteration they can concentrate on, on, on small things. They don't have to, to have to see the broad picture. They can concentrate on really, on really small things. And we have cross-functional teams. That means our teams uh, are not only developers, they are also QA people and designers and all stuff we need actually for, for getting a task done. Sometimes they are technical writers in the team. So we have cross-functional teams that work together on a task. And uh, if, if you, in the next iteration, don't need a designer, the designer just goes to another team that needs a design. So this is how, how it works at Atlassian. And we have distributed teams. We have teams in Sydney and in Poland and in uh, Australia and some independent uh, people working all over the globe. And they are communicating heavily over HipChat. HipChat is our own chat, chat client. And the advantage is if conversation starts in Sydney, the people in San Francisco, when they get up, they can look into HipChat and see all the conversations that happened and can come into the conversation. Actually, it's going that far that people, if, if they are sitting on another, at the next table, they communicate over HipChat because they don't want to disturb other people in the same room and they want to have that documented that conversation. And people can turn off the HipChat client so, so they don't get disturbed if they want to, have, want to be highly concentrated on a task and uh, then they don't get disturbed. So this is, this is really cool and this works, works very well for Atlassian. And we have independent teams. So teams can, can choose their own process they want. So we have teams doing Scrum or kind of Scrum. Uh, we have teams that try Kanban and, and, and a team that do Scramban and, and teams that does their own methodology, whatever that's called. So teams can choose their own thing, how they best work together. For example, uh, as an example, I want to show you the, the Stash team. Um, why the Stash team? Because it's our newest team and we put all things we would like to have in our other teams into the Stash team to try it out. And that works pretty well. So let, let me tell you about the Stash team. Well, first, first of all, let me tell you about Stash. Stash is our uh, Git repository management for enterprise teams. And I'll tell you about the team. The team is working in release cycles. And the release cycle for Stash is seven weeks. We're working in seven weeks release cycles. This is pretty fast for Atlassian because for Jira and Confluence, we have 14 weeks release cycles. Why seven weeks? We want to have ideas as fast as possible to the market. So if we want to have, if we have an idea, it shouldn't lay in our repositories. I mean, if we have done a feature, it should be go out to the customer as fast as possible. And uh, this is this is this is the case if we do seven weeks uh, release cycles. It's going out fast to customers. And this is actually also good for planning. Before we had a release cycle called when it's done, it's done. I mean, and this is really bad for planning. How can marketing plan with that? How can, can QA plan with that if they have to do a big end test? Or how can designers plan with that if they, but when are they needed? They're mostly needed just in the beginning of a release cycle. So this is really good for planning. Marketing can say, okay, you, we need the uh, marketing collateral just before the release. And seven weeks is the maximum feedback cycle. So we need seven weeks. Uh, if, if, if our customers are giving us feedback and saying, oh, this is an awesome feature, but wait, if you do these, these small things to the feature, it's getting even better and we can really use that really really use that so and this takes maximum seven weeks to get this out to the customer and this is this is awesome but this also means if 
A feature missed the deadline, well, the train is gone. I mean, the feature has to wait for the, for the next release. So seven weeks, fixed time box. But this also means that uh, for, for big features that don't fit in the seven weeks release cycles, we have to split them up into, into small pieces. And we are delivering small, small pieces and small features already to the customer that they, they benefit from. So this is, this, is, uh, this, this is what we have to do if we, if we do short release cycles, put everything into small pieces. And what we do at Stash is we're doing the risk features first. We want to be sure we hit the seven week release cycle. So um, maybe we get rid of some small features that we will do at the end. We're doing the risky features first so we'll be sure we're hitting the seven, seven weeks. So if we, if we go down now into tasks a little bit, so if we have a big feature, we put them into, into small features. And these, these small tasks, we we're creating feature branch for each each small task. And a feature branch, a feature in the feature branch is that small that a feature branch just lives for two days. So after two days, we are merging our feature branch back into the main line of production. So, and how we do how do we do uh, code quality? Well, we're collaborating on, on on code quality. We're doing that with pull requests in the stash team. What are pull requests? Well, pull requests are a little bit like, like code reviews. Um, it's actually an, an online discussion about the code, so you can see a virtual merge of your code and you can discuss if you don't like things. And that, that, but that implements, of course, that you have to share your code. Yeah, right. Sharing code is good. <laughs> some, some, some developers think that's, that this is not the case, but uh, well, they don't work for Atlassian. So uh, if if we are if we say yes, this this code looks awesome, please merge it back. We have a rule in the stash team, and the rule says we give a plus one uh, if if we think the the pull request the, the the code is good. So we give a plus one on that pull request, and if we if we receive two plus ones from two developers, we are allowed to merge it back. Why are we doing this, this pull request thing? Well, we actually do that in Stash. So that means the Stash team is using Stash to build Stash. That's what I meant to a few slides before with dog fooling. So, but we're also doing on demand, not Stash on demand, but Jira and Confluence on demand and a release cycle of seven weeks. That's a long time for an on demand for a system in the cloud. People expect much, much shorter release cycles. And we're trying to reach a one week on on demand, one week release cycle on on demand. And this is actually the last passion I want to share with you. The Alessian passion for, for innovation. Um, so let's, let's have a look. Leonard Bernstein once said is, to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. So, and this is what, what it's all about with Alassian ship it days. It's time for your innovation. So if you have an idea, you can, you can build a prototype for that idea in the, in the Alassian ship it days, during Alassian ship it days. So you get, you get your innovation, your idea into the product. But this is not only about innovation. It's actually also about motivation. Because it's really, really motivates if you can see, can show your ideas to, to the rest of the company. And this is also what Alassian Shepard Days is about. You're showing your ideas to the rest of the companies and impress the rest of the companies with your idea. And actually, it's motivating also because, hey, it's so much fun to hack things because you're allowed just to, to hack your stuff. It don't have to be maintained for a long time. You're just doing a prototype for Christ's sake. You just fork the code and, and, and build the stuff, Let, just, just make it work. And this is fun. This is also fun if you don't have to care about maintainability for, for 24 hours. So how does an Atlassian ship it day, how does it, how does it go? So of course we start with an idea and uh, two to three weeks before Atlassian ship it day, we collect our ideas in, in brown bags, in lunch, lunch, lunch 
time uh, meeting. And everybody's writing an idea on a whiteboard and we put on some more customer ideas onto the whiteboard too. And then teams are, are, are gathering around ideas. And if you need a designer, you pick a designer, you ask a designer, do you want to join my cool cool team? And uh, then you have, have your team for your, for your ship it day. And then remember what Leonard Bernstein said. Uh, he said, you need a plan and not quite enough time. And the plan is made a few days before the ship it day. I mean... Designers are doing mock-ups before and, and doing some, some before work. Well, we're actually doing the, the sprint planning meeting a few days before the, before the actual ship it day. And then on a Thursday, 3 p.m., well, the Atlassian ship it day starts. And it's a little bit like, like Jack Bauer in 24, you know? Jack is he's, he's doing so much amazing stuff in just 24 hours. It's so amazing what what he experienced in 24 hours, what, what, yeah, what, what he does in 24 hours. That's so amazing. And it's actually the same with Atlassian Shipper Days. It's amazing what you can do in 24 hours. You, you, you cannot do that in one iteration. So this is really amazing. Jack says actually in 24, wow, this is the longest day of my life. Well, at Atlassian we say, hey, this is the coolest day of this quarter actually, because we're doing this every quarter, so four times a year we're doing an Atlassian ship a day. So let's go back. So we say uh, Thursday, 3 p.m., go, and then we are ready, ready to code. And we're coding the heck out of it. So at, at 6 p.m., we're meeting for some, some pizzas and some energy drinks, and we, we code on until 11, 12. Then most people leave and come back at 7 or 6 or 8. In the morning and then go on coding and wrapping up the stuff and actually at 3 p.m. On, on, on Friday we meet all together in a room and it's actually showtime it's time to show your cool ship a day uh, prototype and we're doing some some lightning talks so five minute time box talks to show our, our cool idea to the rest of the company and then we are voting for the the ship a day winner Afterwards, we're going to a pub, have a beer, but that doesn't long, last for long because everybody's tired from the ship a day. What do you get out of a ship a day? Well, at first, you get, of course, a lot of innovation. And if the product marketing manager sees the innovation, they can say, okay, oh, wow, this is an awesome idea. We should put that on the roadmap. And, but you don't get just only innovation. You also get motivated motivated happy nerds that say awesome great i could could put my idea into the product and and it's so much fun and we had so much fun at the ship a day doing things so you get really motivated developers but what what else do you get out of the ship a day well you you get some crappy code <laughs> yeah sure I mean, you just hack things, so it's, you, you see crappy code, you see not maintainable code, unstable features, and actually nothing is ready for, for final product. Well, what you can do is, of course, put it on the product roadmap, make it, make it pretty, make it uh, maintainable, may, maybe develop it as a, as a plugin, uh, things like that. But if, you, if, if the product marketing says, manage, management says, nah, the product management on the product management says, nah, this is not, not really something we want to have for, for in our product. I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting, but hey, yeah, we have so much other important stuff to, to work on. What, what can you do to make it good code, maintainable code, to make this the feature stable and really polish it for the product? With Atlassian, you can use your 20% time for that. So 20% time is 20% of your working time you can spend on a project. The only rule is it has to do something with our products. You can use it for your ship a day project or for a new idea you have or for cleaning up code if you really want to do that and no, you don't get, get that for, for, uh, as, a, as a sprint goal into your iteration uh, and your sprint. Um, you can use a 20% time for that. So 20% time is actually innovation time. You can pick the time whenever you want and you can do whatever you want with the 
uh, with 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 the thing that it has to do with our product. So, how is it going? Our twenty percent time. What what do you think? Well, we we measure we measure things. As I told that before, and we measure also our twenty percent time. And it's actually actually we measured it. It's more a five to six percent time. So not why 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 are our our developers not take that twenty percent time? Well, we had also a closer look at that and, and discussion about that. Well, actually, it's it's like this cat. What should I what should I grab? The the bird, or maybe the mouse, or maybe the bird or the mouse. So also our developers are in a conflict um, between their own ideas, putting them into the products, and the team goals. I mean, they're working against the sprint goals. If you take a 20% time, you, let your, you have the feeling you let your team down, even though it's totally okay in a, at a last hint to do that, uh, to take 20% time, you, you have the feeling that you, you're letting your team down. So that's why people don't use that 20% time that heavily. Uh, and actually, sometimes you're working for release, so you don't take your 20% time if you want to you wanna get the release out of the door. So this is also a bummer for 20% for time projects. And there are dependencies. You're working together with a team and people depend on you. So you can't take your 20% time because they, they need you for the, for, for the project. So that's why we, we came up with the idea of Innovation Weeks. And Innovation Weeks are, is a planned time. So for example, the Stash team. They're working in seven weeks release cycles, and after they have released uh, their, their, their new Stash version, they take one week off for an innovation week. So they're doing some innovational stuff in that week. They're using their 20% time in that week. And this is planned time, and this is team time, and this is an important thing. The whole team takes a week off. You don't let anything down. You don't, let, you, you don't work against the sprint goals because there are no sprint goals in that week. So, and that works pretty good. Works pretty good for the for the stash team, for example. They came up with some awesome ideas, and this these features are already in stash, implemented in stash. So this we're experimenting with that, and that works pretty well for us. The innovation week. So these are the five passions I want to share with you. You should start with a passion. You should have a passion for getting things done. We have a passion to fail, and to come up again. Uh, we have passionate teams at Alassian and we have a passion for innovation. And as you can see here, we also have a passion for t-shirts. So, well, passion really, really keeps us going. I mean, it's a passion. It's like the marathon runners here. If it's raining, the passion keeps us going. We have the, the big goal in front of us. It's our passion that drives us. And actually, if you fail, well, you, you, you should get up again. It's your passion that gets you up again. I mean, this, this bike rider, he failed and he, he, he fell down, and, but he gets up again and maybe he can win, still win the race with his passion. So, and it's actually the passion that drives us, the passion that we want to put in our products. I mean, our passion should go into our products and our, our customers should get benefits from our passion. And this, this is really what, what our lesson is about. We are passionate people. Uh, and if, if some team leads or managers are listening to this, please, please let the passion grow. Don't put it in caves. If you have, if you have developers in your team um, or other people that are passionate, help them to let their passion grow and to lift their passion. Well, that was it. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to the screencast. Thanks.